Welcome to Public Good App House Maker Interviews. I'm Billy Bickett. Today's conversation with Fedica founder Samer Albatron tackles a burning question. How do we make sure technology actually serves humanity's interests? We dive into the tension between innovation, speed, and public good, exploring some surprising insights about how decentralized technology could reshape our social fabric. Let's get into it. So we're going to start, uh, Samer, with uh, your personal journey. Um, I've got a few questions that uh, I'd like uh, to jump in uh, the conversation to, uh, with. Uh, the first question is, what's the most unconventional uh, step in your career path to date? I have a lot of them. I think a lot of it has to do where I grew up. So I grew up in Iraq when I was a child. So I grew up through wars and atrocities and everything. So there was a lot of things that, you know, having to study in different parts of the world, having to migrate and work in different parts of the world. So I think a lot of these things were quite unconventional and then a regular journey. And then, and then I have worked in like a lot of different places, like from smartphone apps, from building big software, popular software, social media software, like the different industries, legal software. So I worked in the really a vast a range of even medical imaging, working for CT scanners, MRI scanners. And for the last 14 years, I've been working on, on with social media. And I love it because it's like, it's very diverse. Is there a thinker that is a reference point for you, uh, uh, whether it's a computer scientist or uh, a sociologist or a philosopher, or who, who's influencing the way you think about the power of technology to uh, shape society. Yeah, I think in terms of people, I think the usual names for me, I would say probably Bill Gates and Steve Jobs is the other one. Why, why Gates? Why Jobs? Yeah, so definitely Bill Gates and Steve Jobs started in technology when it was like computer technology, when it was really at the early stages. And I think that there was almost nothing at the time when they started for personal computing, that is. And they have really moved us into like where computers are very accessible and we're very connected today. And it goes from personal computers and then Steve Jobs with iPhone, obviously. So w they made us quite connected. And that really have changed how we use the technology and how we interact with each other. Before we just used to pick up the phone and talk with, now we just text each other. We just talk to each other by computers. Now we're talking right now on video. So I think it's quite different than what it was before their time. What, what's a strongly held belief about technology that you've had to unlearn since the beginning of your journey? I think maybe one thing was like you learn something and you think that you learn everything. <laughs> and then once, once you start working with it, then you realize you're, whatever you learn is only a drop of the bucket, a drop in the, in, the, in the sea. And then after that is you'll have to learn new things after it becomes obsolete after a while. So you'll have to learn a new set of technology after a while. Mm, mm. So the naive ar technical arrogance uh, it on is, some yeah, level. It is, yeah, very much confidence, yes. Is there any belief that you held about how technology works or how technology interacts with individuals or groups of people that has shifted for you significantly in the last five years? Yeah, like being in touch with people all the time, like me personally, I, I love wor working in the trenches. Uh, so I answer even help desk tickets and go and answer people's questions uh, when I have time. When, when the help desk support team is, is off or on weekends or something, I go and jump and answer tickets myself. And, and I think it's quite different how people see technology. Like there's different ways of people to see it and use it than what you want. So you, you build the software in a certain way. You think that's how people are going to use it. And they use it in an entirely different way. And in a lot of times it gives you ideas of how to make this, how to make the software better and, oh, this is a great idea. Maybe I was thinking that's how people would use it. And now, oh no, that's totally wrong. That's how people should use the software is by just one person telling you how they use it. Let's unpack the relevance of uh, the Fediverse uh, for, for civil society. Uh, what's the most underrated aspect of the Fediverse for civil society organizations? Yeah, I think the most underrated thing about federated networks in general is the fact that you own the data that you have is currently all of us when we go on social media as a person as an organization as anyone we go and we start posting we start engaging and we start to build an audience at the end of the day we don't own that audience on a centralized social network it's our facebook fans are our facebook's property if we quit facebook we lose those fans our Twitter audience, our, our X audience, our own X. And if we 
leave that platform or if the platform decides to shut you down, then you, you don't get to or And also your content, whatever you publish, if your platform doesn't like what you publish, they'll tell you to take it down. Versus on federated social networks is you own that content. If you don't like it, you move with your content, with your audience to somewhere else, to some another instance, another server that hosts your content. I think that is very liberating for everyone. It makes us, we're building the audience that is ours. We're not building the audience that belongs to someone else. For those in our audience who are newbies in this world, how would you explain the Federal of a civil society leader in one sentence, an executive director that's not following technology trends, but is open to learning and exploring new ways to have more data sovereignty? Yeah, it, it, it is a little tricky because right now we're at the at the early stages of the of federated social network. So there is different competing protocols. There is different networks. Eventually, I believe all of them will start talking to, to, to each other. So I think because currently there are bridges being built uh, in between them. I think the best way to start is by actually maybe if, if you're just beginning setting up account and start to build audience in, in somewhere. So then it's not really too late for you. If, if say, the Fediverse becomes common in five years, you don't want to start in five years. You probably want to start today. Build that audience somewhere, understanding how it, how different it is than regular and traditional centralized social networks. And then once you have that, you have a good understanding of how it works. And then you can choose whether you want to build your own server, set up your own instance, et cetera. There's a lot of talk these days about social media fracturing society, fracturing our attention, the negative influence on teens in particular, and the impact on democracy writ large. What's a non-obvious way the Fediverse could reshape democracy? One of the advantages of of federated social networks is that people can choose what content they see. Currently, with centralized social networks, the content that we see is decided by an algorithm that is serving the company that's providing you that social network. So they're trying to maximize engagement. They're trying to maximize ads and clicks on ads. And that's really the objective of why we have those social networks for free. On the federated social networks, some of them will eventually have ads, but I believe you can pick a service that really shows you a feed that is catered for the content you want to see. Some and some of the feeds are just plain as the old days of social media feed where you follow people and you see all the content from these people. And that's just plain and simple. And that's really democratizing social media by giving the power to the user to see the content they want to see as opposed to you're seeing con- content based on commercial needs of the company serving the content. Got it. What's uh, the biggest misconception in your experience that nonprofits have about uh, Fedica, your product? Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe one that comes to mind is, and we're trying to change that. Our company name used to be called Tweeps Map, and it was Twitter only service. So at the time before our transformation to be federated social network friendly, a lot of users know us. That. And also at the flip side, a lot of people think we're new because we just changed our name a couple of years ago. So they don't find anything new about us. So it takes a while before they recognize, oh, you guys have been around for 14 years. So that's one set. And the other set would say, oh, you guys are Twitter only too. Let's dig deeper into this value proposition for nonprofits. How do you quantify the value of Fedica for the nonprofit user? There is a lot of things that would be useful for a nonprofit u- user. I think the main one is the ability to be on as many social networks as, po- as possible at once without having you to go to different platforms and then plug in your content and publish and engage with your audience that way. The second one is the ability to build audiences. So instead of usually social media tools give you ability to publish, but then that's where they stop. Versus with Fedica, we really help you discover and zoom into within a subset of your audience. So to, under- to have a much deeper understanding of that audience and also reach out to new audiences that you don't know of. So for example, if you're trying to do an event in, say, New York City, and then you want to find CEOs or founders or someone within that space, you can actually zoom into that subset of audience, whether within your existing audience, or you can go into audiences that you don't have and then discover them. So I think that really helps you grow that way. 
I think if, if we're going to talk about the most common use case is really about saving the time. So going into multiple social networks. And for the longest time, as the name implies, Fedica, which I could talk about why we changed the name, we're focused on bridging centralized social media and federated social networks. So for the longest time, we were pretty much the only social network that supported all major federated social networks for well over a year. And then, so that really helps you grow that audience head up to on, on, on those federated networks. And then, but at the same time, you're also not ignoring your existing audience on centralized social networks. So that really a big time saver for a lot of people because you don't have to jump to 10 websites at the same time to update your content. And then the second one is, and that's where people want it to the next level is audience discovery, audience growth. So trying to understand what is my UK audience like about my content? What is my US audience like about my content? Um, who, who are the people I can reach out to if I have an event in that location? Or who, what demographic of people enjoy my content? So that just all those important elements are, are quite helpful to zoom in and then helps you to amplify your message. So if you're trying to find someone, say, about policy on technology within your audience, you can search for them and then you can message them and say, hey, I have this content collaborate on this project or can you give me a boost on this content? That, that's, that is a different way of doing social media than just, I'm going to post it and let everyone read what I posted. It's too directional. Yeah, it sounds like it's bi-directional and it's more, much more holistic and a dashboard oriented kind of approach. Yeah. Who are the users that from nonprofits? Are they social media managers, community builders? What are their roles, titles? A lot of them are social media managers. A big chunk of them are social media managers. So those are the brave souls that will write the content and hopefully it performs on social media and trying to reach out to their audience on social media. And those are the people that are basically content creators. So they're the people that create the content, schedule it, organize it, yeah. and, and work with all that. And then there is a second subset of audience, which is the analytical side. So those People are more into trying to get insights and trying to find out where is our audience, which of our content performs, which web demographic of audience, and how do we change the composition of our audience? For example, if you find yourself, you're only limited your audience to a certain cluster, maybe you can expand it into a, a, a different cluster, and then also doing a research on other areas and trying to understand where is their audience and what's their demographic and how we can change the composition of them. Got it. So that's the web analytics and strategy and insights people exactly. on digital teams. First question is how you think decentralized technology can change power dynamics in civil society? Yeah, interesting. I think there is a lot of dynamics happening with centralized web is where we're at the mercy of that platform. They can make decisions on their own. They will service the content that serves them best really necessarily serves the user best. So I think when we talk about decentralized web or decentralized social media specifically, it's the power, it shifts more to the user. Because if I don't like this, I can move somewhere else. I'm not going to lose any. I'm not locked into your platform because I own the audience. I own the content. I think it's different. So then at that point becomes that social network or even the provider of the social the decentralized web. They'll have to really make sure that people stay on their platform because they like it and make sure that whatever decisions they make are not really harmful. That makes people would leave because it's much easier to leave uh, from a decentralized network than it is to leave from a centralized one. Which traditional institutions, 20th century institutions are most threatened by decentralized technology? I think all the technology space currently is very much centralized. So all those big corporations, say you think of Google, telecom, like the cable company, like everything in technology in our history has been very much centralized. There is very few instances, except for the web itself, everything else has been centralized. And then we have the web where we can browse any website. Imagine the days of AOL where you can only browse a certain websites and can only go to those, but now you can go anywhere. So it's very different. We've, we've moved into very much anywhere on the internet, but not within the internet itself. Like we're still very centralized. But I think all the big players really are honestly threatened. And I'm actually quite impressed with Facebook adopting, ad adopting the, the Fediverse, because that's one thing that they're very much centralized, collective their data, but they're very much the biggest player, right? 
decentralized social media. So it's very interesting take from them. But I think that one thing for them to acknowledge is that the world is moving toward decentralized social media. And if they're not, if they're going to continue to be centralized, they're becoming irrelevant. And they're, they could become like MySpace at some point. So I think they're, that's one way for them to acknowledge that's where the world is moving. So it's better that we adopt it and acknowledge it and just give that better experience to users. Yeah, there's this parallel decision they made with open sourcing Llama as well. Let's talk user participation and public good technology. We're talking about this intentional pursuit of building tools for the public good or public benefit. All of these movements are a response to, I think, what was this previous value proposition from social media and big yeah. tech companies that they were building technology to empower us and, yeah. and give us a voice. And it yeah. turned out that the, the, the business model demanded that they would hold the data and our attention was the product. And now yeah. here we are in this next iteration of the web trying yeah. to find our way. In terms of user participation in public good tech, what's the hardest trade-off between uh, user autonomy and community cohesion? What's the, this is for me, it feels like a huge, a, a, a huge challenge if we're building decentralized tools in terms of giving people the power, but also giving the community a sense of cohesion because it's so distributed and decentralized. I think their discovery is certainly a lot harder because you're not in one community. So if you, especially if it was a community of smaller communities, so you got clusters within the communities of subgroups and then they would be knowing and talking with each other. But then there is another cluster somewhere else that are talking with each other. Cross communication between the subgroups is, is a lot harder. And I think it's a difficult mindset to get to at the beginning. And a lot of things, a lot of people tried to migrate to Mastodon in 2022. And they went there and they found it incredibly difficult. Like they, they could not wrap their hand around it. Oh, I need to pick a server. Why do I need to pick a community? I just want so I want Mastodon. I don't want to. Mastodon for techies, Mastodon for art. I, I don't want these things. So why do I need to pick a community and a server for that community? So it was much harder. And then there was even sub-communities like geographical. So it was difficult. And a lot of people could not do it and they left. So I think, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. That maybe we're, as a society, we're not mature enough to have that kind of level. So that's why you see certain platforms like Threads or Blue Sky. It's a lot easier and getting a lot more users because it's easier. It's just one place you go to, you create an account and you're done. You don't have to think, you don't have a million choice to pick from. That makes it easier for people to get to. But maybe eventually, I think once, once everyone learns how federation works and how you actually get to choose your community, your sub community, and then you can move somewhere else, then it will be easier for people to move. And maybe people will stay with those mega platforms. Uh, will cater for the average person, but then only people will move to get to their own niche communities. What's a non-obvious way uh, Fedica encourages civic engagement? Uh, I think generally, we don't push this front and center, but I think this covery of other accounts, I think that's a, a key piece. Not many people know, and usually only those seeking it will come to us and say, I want to search for those for a certain type of personas to engage with certain people. And that's a piece that's really not very obvious. We don't really advertise it front and center on the service, but I think it's a lot of our users use it to engage and to expand their audience. So, so it's like the collaborative filtering that points users to adjacent or shared affinity types of organizations, which they yeah. may be learning from or collaborating from in the future, perhaps. It's funny because like we talk about decentralized world and the decentralized world means you have really fragmented communities. So it's almost like right. that is centralizing everything, bringing all the aggregating, yeah, 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 aggregating them all in one place. So then you can right. get them all in one place because it's really right. difficult to find them. So you're creating this sort of big tent for yeah. these social media managers, these community managers to find the others. Tell the audience about the biggest risk to the future of the Fediverse writ large. The Fediverse is a new concept and it can be complicated. The average person does not understand. The name Fediverse itself is scary. Like it's complicated. It sounds like a technology jargon. I think at some point it will be simplified to something small. I think Fed is probably going to be the one, but who knows? And I think the concept is a lot of people think it's like Federated is this federal government. 
<laughs> support American friends. Yeah. So there is a lot of, you know, barriers to adoption. But I think been, I think people are growing into it. And then there's a lot of it. I think one of one of the greatest things that happened was definitely adoption of meta adopting the metaverse into their threads. I think that was really helpful exposing it to the world and people are easing into it. So that's one. I think the other challenge is, is people might find it just too complex and they might not like it. They might prefer their old centralized world, even though it might work against their benefit or against their needs, but they will go and with, was much easier. I'm going back to Facebook. I don't want to, I'm back to that. I don't want to mm. do this. So that could mm. be uh, another challenge. And then obviously there is also challenges of mega corporations taking over the Fediverse, just like how the what happened to the internet. So the internet was very much decentralized, but then big corporations came and made it centralized silos. So it could be, there's a lot of people when Meta decided to join the Fediverse, a lot of communities in the, on the Mastodon and other federated social networks, they were saying, oh, we're going to block, we're going to have Fedi block, which is the term to block a certain form. We're going to Fedi block threads and not allow them to be part of our network. And some of them, group together and they announced that they will ally, create alliances to block it. But I think that was just didn't go very well. It's like the biggest instances continued and federated and was successfully federated. And that it is a valid risk. They were not. A lot of people are hesitant to change, but I think it is a valid risk. We don't know if Meta will continue to be open about their support for the Fediverse. Maybe at some point they'll go, oh no, we're going to decide to leave it. Or we're going to say, or we're going to decide to only implement certain features. Maybe move your audience. You're stuck with us now. You build your, your audience, but you can't move it anymore. So that could possibly, that could be a possible thing to do. So we don't know. So that's another risk that is valid. Um, hopefully it will not materialize, but we don't know. Let's take a, a bullish case on um, decentralized platforms uh, progressing and accelerating as trust uh, diminishes uh, across these different user bases, not just in the U.S., but uh, across the world. What's your bet on decentralized platforms surpassing centralized ones as the dominant choice? What year is that going to happen in your best mm. case? Here's what I think is going to happen. I think eventually all the major platforms will federate because imagine it's 1990 and then you're AOL and say, ah, oh, we're only going to keep AOL customers to be on AOL. You can't join the internet. If you want to email your friends, they have to have an AOL email address. You can. I think it's very unrealistic. I think eventually, one by one, once the network federate, all of them will have to federate. Uh, in my view, will happen regardless, they, even if they came and kicking streaming. But as to your question, what year? I don't know. That's a very tough question. I, I think technology is moving very fast. So I wouldn't think it's um, uh, impossible to, to have it done, let's say 2029 or something. Let's say the, the majority of social media users will be on decentralized, I think. One of the things that seems is a lurking thought in the back of my mind as I've been tracking the web broadly is this adoption, the rate of adoption, right? So when you see ChatGPT ship and in 90 days, 100 million users yeah. are using the app, it's a hard pill to swallow yeah. when you start considering the rate of change in this movement. It gets really difficult to buy the, that, buy the idea that adoption will keep up with the changing behaviors. So which, how do you reconcile that as someone who's putting so much of your energy and time and resources into this movement and AI coming as this sort of wave, uh, driving people's attention, shifting their behavior and how they interface with the internet and their own app portfolio? How do you reconcile that? Yeah, it's crazy. It's difficult to understand. And I'm old, but I'm not very old. So it's difficult to, even as someone who is so immersed in technology, to imagine all this shift that's happening right now. It's very difficult to comprehend. So I, I can't imagine how average person would see that. But I think it's, I think it's great. I love change. It's progress. I see it as progress. So I think it's good that we're adopting. But we also there is also certain things that we have to be a little bit careful about how fast we adopt certain things because there are certain guardrails are put in place in a lot of things that we do. But, but we don't know how AI will change society. We don't know how AI will impact people. Like I always think that in, in the not very distant future, AI will make a lot of jobs obsolete. That's clear. Currently, we see a lot of it now 
even software development. There's now a lot of software developers complaining that it's not easy to find jobs now as opposed to in the past. So that is sure. coming from AI, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But I think uh, I was surprised because I always thought that AI would actually impact blue collar jobs before white collar jobs. It actually, the opposite effect, it's, it's now the white collar jobs that were impl- uh, impacted first, not the blue collar yeah. jobs. And, but I think that blue collar jobs are going to be next and those will actually have um, a bigger impact on society because now you have people from different segments of society that are finding it difficult to find to earn a living. And so we'd have to shift as a society, shift in general, and how this will change how people may earn money in the first place. So I think that changes the fabric of society. I know we're, we're going a little bit in tangent here. But from some, I think there is a big impact that's going to happen to society because of the, the impact of AI into how we live, how we interact, how we make money. It's a big change. And I don't think anyone is ready for it. And sadly, the only people who can be ready for it are governments and the governments aren't doing it. It's almost as a sideshow for them. So well, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that at some point some people will start thinking about this. I, I, I suspect there must be a single obstacle that you are designing to route around that unlocks adoption for Fetica and more broadly the Fediverse. The story I hear when I show up at D-Web Camp or other D-Web events is this refrain about the user interface and innovation at the interface level will unlock adoption. What's the thing that you're focused on that you're saying, this is the thing, this is the one most important thing that's going to unlock participation from nonprofits, civil society, or any other user groups, but considering we're in the business of trying to support nonprofits. What- so there is a lot of elements at play. Sure. Uh, so I don't think there is one thing, but there is one thing which we really focused on that was sure. on the onset was that being on federated social networks, meaning you being on multiple platforms, but also being on a centralized platforms at the same time. So we're just going to make everyone's life easy. So instead of us having to just go and not just on multiple platforms, we're going to make it so simple. I'm going to type a message as if I'm typing it for one platform. I'm going to click one button to send it on all of them together at the same time. No customization, no nothing. Say I am having, today is a nice day. It's a nice weather. I don't want to say, put a photo for this, put a video. I'm just going to type one message and then send it to all of them and click. So make it simple to begin with. But then also the second level is, but what if I want to customize it? I want to make a poll on LinkedIn, but I can't make a poll on other networks. So then you can click a button that says, now you can customize it. So we basically, I think that was the biggest challenge is make it really simple, but also be sophisticated at the same time. So then the power uh, we don't just give you the lowest common denominator, but we also give you the most advanced vis- version of that social network. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. I hear that as uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, easy button. So it's like, h- how do you make how do you make the easy button? And also, how do you empower the top 1% of your users to to let it to rip to rip your platform and use it in creative ways you've never even imagined so or your designers never imagined yeah oh yeah so that was the main thing for fedica itself for the fediverse i think that's another challenge it's the fediverse itself i think that definitely starting from zero audience is hard for anyone you go now and you go post something on your Facebook, which you've been building for the last 10 years, if, especially if you're a nonprofit, and then you go and people respond, yeah, but now go on a new network and you post and you have no followers and then you've got no engagement and you'll be disappointed. And I think that's a harder thing to unlock. One of the things we did is, again, I'll go back to our discovery tool. That's one thing you can grow your audience by discovering your account and, and then follow them is, is the least thing you could do in it. Hopefully you can build your community that way, but it, it is harder to build an audience from scratch. And that's one thing we'll have to do, but hopefully we'll only have to do it once because like I, like I said, when you are in a, in a federated social network, you own that audience. So you are not going to lose it after that point. So I think we're going to have to start over, but, but, but then as you build it this time, it's yours. So there's very little risk. What is the question you wish people asked about decentralized technology more. 
Yeah, I think the question that I think everyone should ask is why are we locked into centralized social network? I think that's the that's a better question. It's like why don't we own our audience? I when you go and build an audience on a platform, you have worked so hard. A lot of companies or social media managers work for 10 years to build that audience. But at the end of the day, they don't own it. So one day the platform, and I remember actually one of the biggest changes was Facebook. I think it was. Yeah, like I remember they changed the algorithm. They changed the yeah. algorithm. So that yeah. if you have a Facebook page, only 1% of your audience will see your, your, your yeah. posts unless yeah. you pay ads, right? So yeah. that was a big change. And I think a lot of people were happy because they have really worked so hard to build that audience. And now they lost 99% of it unless they pay money. So And they're allocating ad revenue on a monthly yeah. basis, annually. Yeah. They've allocated the spend, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just to talk to that audience they built. That was their work to build yeah. it. It wasn't yes. somebody else's work. It is public money that was invested to build that audience. And now you have to pay more money to, <laughs> yeah. to talk to them. So I think, yeah. that's, I think that's the better question. Why aren't we federated? Why aren't we decentralized? I think that's a better question. Because no. you should own their audience. I think that's just a great. common sense. That's great. I, I, I feel like that's a buried question. Yeah. The, the design of the current model and default has, was so brilliant from an yeah. interface perspective, from an easy button perspective. That yeah. It's like fish to water. We don't even acknowledge that we're in the current system, yes. right? It's the large majority of users, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's why we host these kinds of conversations to elevate the, the strategy, the strategic thinking, right? This has been really educational and helpful and fun. Tell me what Fedica is, Samar, please. So Fedica, historically, we used to be a, a Twitter-only tool. It used to be called Tweepsmoke. And it helps you analyze and understand your Twitter audience and also helps you engage with them and, and publish. Uh, back when social media were, it was becoming a little bit more uh, decentralized, we thought we should actually make a quick push. And so we thought of ourselves into, instead of just becoming a social media tool, we become a bridge between centralized social media and federated social media. So we started building for that future. And, and with that, we also have to change our name and hence the name Fedica, the FED is for federated social media and the C is for centralized social media. So imagine it more like a bridge. So you don't have to abandon your existing audience on centralized social media, but also build a federated future for your audience that you own. Tell us about where people should go to learn more about you and Fedica and any resources you want to drop. So the best place to learn about Fedica is obviously Fedica.com. We also have mobile apps for iPhone and Android, so you can check that out. But the Fediverse itself, I think it's a vast ocean. So there is a lot of different social networks. I recommend checking out the easiest one is go to Wikipedia, which is a public good website. So go and check it out. There is, check the word Fediverse. I think that would be a very good starting point to learn more about the Fediverse. As to what social networks are in the Fediverse currently right now, let's talk about Federated Social Network, not just Fediverse. So the Fediverse itself is Mastodon, Miski. There's a few other smaller players. So Flipboard joined the Fediverse. WordPress actually also is now joining the Fediverse as well. So there is a lot of different ones. And then the biggest one, for sure, is definitely Meta. So Meta Threads is joining the Fediverse. So those are the, the main players in the Fediverse. But with the bigger uh, federated social networks, so check out Blue Sky is a very good emerging. They actually uh, are gaining a good traction in the last few days. There is also other federated network interesting ones. There is uh, smaller federated social networks and there is bigger so federated social networks. There is like different ways that you can all check out. Check out the Wikipedia page and check out the alternative section as well to look into alternatives to the Fediverse because it's not just one, one protocol. There's also the concept of bridges. So there is deep, there are people, developers working on creating bridges between the different protocols. So you can, for example, engage with Blue Sky Post from Mastodon itself and vice versa. So there are bridges happening. So the Federated Social Networks, even though they're from protocols in the future, they will all be working and communicating with each other. Thank you so much. I'm going to share a few resources as well. And I want to introduce one to you that you likely don't know about because we haven't spent a lot of time promoting it. The first is this public good technology rubric, which we developed, which was all about 
trying to put together a, a core set of questions for technologists and entrepreneurs, makers like yourself, to consider the public good technology ecosystem in an intentional way. And so right. we'll share that with you post Perfect. the interview. We'll also include that in the notes. We also mentioned earlier that we produced this DWeb initiative last year called Accelerating Makers, which has a collection of use cases, DWeb use cases, so that if you're interested in decentralized technology, want to see how other nonprofits or civil society groups are using decentralized technology, we've got a neat notion database that you can view and sort all kinds of different use cases. And we also have a, a resource section in the Acceler Accelerating Makers website that, that has explainers and events that were recorded so that if you have an interest in diving deeper into the topic, we invite you to do that. Thank you again, uh, Summer, for spending the time. I hope we can pick this conversation up again in the future. Absolutely. And uh, we'd love to see you in our uh, community. Amazing. Yeah, that would be great. Most technology-oriented conversations end with promises. This one ends with proof. In our show notes, you'll find two things, a rubric that changes how you think about building technology and a collection of stories about people who are already doing it. No theory, no maybes, just real civil society organizations solving real problems with decentralized tech. The tools are ready. The examples are clear. What will you build next?